uh, so as already uh, mentioned my name, I'm Mike Clark. I'm based here in Trinity College Dublin at the School of Nursing and Midwifery, but properly um, at Queen's University in Belfast. I have worked for a very long time in something called the Cochrane Collaboration. Some of you who work in healthcare will be familiar with that. It's an organisation that tries to bring together research evidence relevant to the effects of healthcare interventions. And evidence aid, which is what you'll hear a bit more about from Bonix, was something that began after the Indian Ocean tsunami on St. Stephen's Day 2004, when as an organisation the Cochrane Collaboration felt if we want to be a world leader in terms of providing evidence, what are we actually doing when an event like this happens? And clearly, most of the work of the Cochrane Collaboration is about ordinary aspects of healthcare. But what are we doing when something as large as the Indian Ocean tsunami strikes, kills tens of thousands, uh, has an effect on millions of people? And so it's grown from that. And now we're in a position where we're thinking, well, what do the people who plan for disasters and other humanitarian emergencies? What do the people who respond to those things need? What do the people who are engaged in something called disaster risk reduction need about evidence? And how can those of us who are primarily researchers, I'm neither a practitioner uh, nor an aid worker, uh, I would class myself really purely as a researcher, how can we uh, ensure that the work that we do helps? So the idea is to, we'll have the, the uh, four talks with an opportunity after each talk to ask questions. Then, as Sarah said, we're going to break into four small groups so that there's an opportunity to discuss some things in more detail. You have questions that those groups are going to try and tackle. It doesn't matter if that small group isn't one that you feel you know a great deal about because hopefully as you see and talk about the questions you'll realise that these are fairly general questions about how we should be doing things better. And then we'll have 15 minutes or so at the end to hear back from the small groups and to just get a sense of how we could all be working together to ensure the, the sort of fundamental aim is that when people are trying to make decisions, they can make those decisions in a well-informed way. How can they be given the information to help them do that? How can those of us who are engaged in research make sure that we generate the information that they need? And then when people are out there in the field responding, how can the information that they gather be recycled back into the process so that we can have a much better understanding of this, the, you know, the fundamental concept being we want to do more good than harm. Everybody engaged in this process wants to do more good than harm. And we want to make sure that they have the information to help them to achieve that. Uh, so I'm going to, um, how we're, we're going to work this is that it's being recorded. So uh, the speaker will be near this laptop, which will be controlling the slides. We'll all sit back down in the front so that we can see the slides as each person is speaking and then I'll just take any questions for each individual before we break into the small groups. So I'm going to introduce Cara O'Brien first. Cara works as a diplomat in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade since 1994, been posted to Paris and to the UN in Geneva. Has worked with the Irish Aid Programme since 2002, managing a range of programmes on the civil society side of Irish aid before focusing on humanitarian issues and programming since 2004. She's a graduate of TCD in history and political science and has a master's degree in public management and human rights. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you, colleagues, um, for, the, for the kind invitation to Irish Aid to, um, to participate in this event. Uh, we think it's very interesting, potentially very useful, um, as, as Mike said, in terms of, in terms of uh, situating our responses and our, our decision-making in an in a ever more evidence-based context. Um, I hope this doesn't run on too long, so I know Mike has a watch there, so um, I haven't timed myself, but please feel free to uh, intercept me if I'm going on too long. Um, what I've been asked to do is speak from my own experience, so essentially what I'm hoping to do is give you a brief enough overview of how things work within Irish aid at present, and I suppose it's, it's a mesh, essentially, of 
the practitioner approach plus the kind of policy basis that we always hope are, are underpinning what we do um, and also how we how we collaborate with research institutions and hopefully integrate um, their findings and their viewpoints into our decision making process and policy making process. Um, maybe very briefly to set the context in terms of Irish AIDS humanitarian aid budget presently and, and, and in more straitened times we're still managing an annual budget of something in the region of 60 million euro um, per year. Um, and then an additional something in the region of 25 million euro, which is focusing on fragile states and, and stability type programming. So um, a significant enough budget for a small donor. In terms of, I suppose, the breadth of our programming, it straddles the kind of emergency onset, sudden, sudden onset uh, emergency response through transition responses to natural disasters and, and conflict situations on to hopefully recovery and, and, um, and, and broader development in, in due course. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned our kind of policy engagements with with a range of different academic organisations, and that would that would represent something in the region of five hundred thousand euro per year, um, and an additional five hundred thousand euro per year to um, I suppose what you'd call conflict institutions, organisations uh, researching into conflict and fragility in various contexts. Um, since I have the the, the 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 opportunity to be the first speaker, I suppose that we I was asking myself what what is evidence-based humanitarian aid and what's our understanding of it from the Irish aid perspective. Um, and I think the, the, the definition here that's the application of current best practice and evidence to strengthen the appropriateness, effectiveness and impact of humanitarian assistance, I think that represents from the Irish aid perspective very much what we're striving towards and what we've been striving towards over the last um, five or six years and I think epitomised in the likes of the tech evaluation into the aftermath of the tsunami. Um, I think the work that we've done in evaluation after the, the Haitian earthquake last year and the work that a, a good number of donor agencies have done and, and also on a collaborative basis um, in terms of lesson learning from, from the response to the Haitian earthquake, um, our efforts around knowledge management within all of our individual organisations um, to try to ensure that what's, what, is, uh, what is being learned is being captured and is being integrated into, into policy planning and decision making. Um, and I think what we're relying on to, to deliver this is essentially strengthened, ever strengthened data collection processes, data analysis processes, um, and in due course, obviously building on, on good baseline data, um, which in sudden onsets is obviously a very, very challenging um, objective. I think we recognise that there is a requirement there to strengthen the link between research policy and practice. Um, and uh, realising that none of those on their own um, will, will stand, basically. No one component can stand. Um, the challenge, really, for Irish Aid as a, as a donor is to integrate the three effectively. And I think we, we recognise that this is, this is quite challenging um, from a capacity perspective as much as everything else, um, as well as the context, that, the types of context that we're, we're responding to. Um, but there have been a good deal, deal of developments within Irish Aid in recent years in the whole area of... Um, results-based approaches and managing for development results and I think we're quite optimistic that there's there's a lot of potential there um, from a kind of broad organizational perspective to integrate better lessons learned learning evidence-based approaches. Um, we're also conscious that it's 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 a cooperative exercise requires coordination um, and, and the type of political will I suppose that that underpins so much of humanitarian response um, both I suppose political with, with a lowercase p and a capital p in terms of the kind of complications and complexities that underpin all of our responses in the humanitarian field. Um, I think essentially that we realise that our role is to advocate um, in these types of situations. Just maybe briefly, um, from the practitioner's perspective again, how decision making happens within the humanitarian department um, in Irish aid. And I suppose we kind of construe these, these uh, interventions as our process partners. Um, these are our information sources, a range of information sources that we'd rely upon when we're making decisions. Um, again, quite often in the kind of sudden onset types of situations that are that are particularly challenging, as I mentioned. Um, so very much reliant on the UN's consolidated appeals process, um, the UN assessment reports that would arrive in at an early stage in in a in a either a conflict situation or or a natural disaster context. Um, equally, from our NGO partners to those working on the ground, those with local partners their assessments. Um, from a health perspective, and obviously recognising the, the strong components within um, the Evidence Aid uh, initiative so far on health, we, we'd work quite closely with the likes of CRED. Um, and we'd also rely on a range of indices that exist um, within the EU context, um, UN context, Global Hunger, Hunger Index, 
which basically will, will give us a certain sense of the severity of individual crises to inform our decision making and how to how to respond best. I think we, we'd say that in our view, information is evidence. It's It comes back then to what obviously is underpinning that information. And I suppose the challenge in this context for us is to ensure that those um, these interventions that we're, we're relying on and these information sources that we're relying on are in fact in turn underpinned by evidence. Um, and I was asking myself, how do we how do we ensure that? And I suppose the only the only way is to ask the question. And um, I think that that needs a, a greater rigor um, in due course in terms of establishing that that is in fact the case with our partners. So I suppose to look at. Um, was a type of matrix in a sense of um, of what we've done over recent years. Sorry, I've missed a slide. Um, our appraisal process, I suppose, then going on from the initial uh, assessment of the nature of a situation and how you know how we um, how we assess the needs, how we assess the most appropriate response. We then move on to making our, our decisions in terms of which partners we're going to support and um, how we're going to respond to the situation um, from a funding perspective as much as anything else. Um, and I suppose just to look a little bit through how that evidence base informs our decision making, uh, the individual overall response, an agency is basically submitting to us their, their assessment of what the nature of the crisis is. Um, we're then going to draw from our understanding of what the evidence is to, to assess whether or not their, their approach and their, their proposed response is the most appropriate one. Um, how relevant is the agency response as, as we understand it? How are they targeting the affected population? Are they identifying the most vulnerable, as we understand it, again, from the evidence available to us? And how are they using baseline information? Um, how credible is it? How reliable is it? And how rolling is it, I suppose? How does it evolve over the duration of, um, of the emergency? We'd also rely to a large extent on our assessment of the capacity of the organisation or the partner that we're talking about working with, their track record, their credibility, uh, their local partnerships, how embedded are they essentially in the local community and in terms of their capacity to respond to a natural disaster or a conflict type situation. Um, evidence from uh, I suppose the, the cluster approach, something people may be familiar with, is a, a UN humanitarian initiative which has evolved in recent years um, to, to essentially strengthen the individual sectoral areas of, of humanitarian response um, and to ensure that uh, lead agencies work closely together, that there is coordination, that, that people are basically strengthening their response through collaboration to the extent possible. Um, adherence to standards is obviously something that's, that's very important to us in, in terms of our partnerships, ensuring that the agencies that we support and the agencies we work with are paying more than lip service to um, the likes of the sphere standards, formal organisations like People in Aid that basically... Um, adhere to individual standards and humanitarian response, certain thresholds, certain targets, certain parameters. And um, that again will give us a strong, a strong underpinning to our support to those agencies. Um, and financial oversight, this I think is becoming increasingly important uh, in recent years and the extent to which agencies can can reassure us as to their as to their financial underpinnings. Um, all of these I suppose factors play into the appraisal processes that we use for a range of different funding tools. Um, both at the, the kind of, again, sudden onset emergency funding end of things, um, but also going into something called the HPP process, which is a, a, a programme partnership that we've had with a range of Irish NGOs in recent years and international NGOs for that matter, which kind of funds protracted situations, kind of ongoing emergencies, um, and that strive to be more, I suppose, strategic in terms of how the funding is provided, in terms of how we work with the partners, in terms of how much... Um, we basically see to our NGO partners in terms of identifying their priorities and their priority situations that they um, that they should intervene in and that we will support them for. Um, again, if if the evidence base is strong enough across all of those appraisal processes, that that underpins the, the HPP process and, and strengthens our our ability to support our NGOs in a much more strategic way. Um, then briefly going on to I suppose some examples of of where we've been or we hope to think we've been innovative over recent years in terms of integrating the evidence base into our own work. Um, innovation and piloting, I suppose we point to some examples going back almost 10 years at this stage, where the humanitarian side of the house has essentially 
supported some fairly innovative, uh, groundbreaking uh, developments in areas such as um, community-based management of acute malnutrition, um, community-based therapeutic feeding, um, supporting organisations that I suppose were taking risks at that point in terms of the types of um, scientific breakthroughs in in, um, in in therapeutic feeding, taking a chance on them, providing financial support to essentially seed funding to, to these types of initiatives. And um, they've become increasingly integrated into the mainstream, if you like, of humanitarian response, which we think is something very, very positive. Um, we were also an early supporter of the likes of cash-based programming, looking particularly, I suppose, around the, the time of the Southern Africa food crisis of the early 2000s. Um, again, something that was relatively risky at the time, the idea of providing cash transfers to communities in emergencies was, was relatively controversial. Um, but I think, again, we felt that if the evidence base was there and the partnerships were strong enough, in our estimation, we could, we could take these types of risks. And um, I think they've, they've borne fruit. Um, also, in maybe some sectoral areas, the likes of gender-based violence, we've in recent years been very active in the likes of the Irish NGO consortium um, working on gender-based violence. And I suppose in terms of our own programming, that's again borne fruit in terms of the types of partnerships that we've been able to support. And a recent example, I suppose, would be with the, the likes of International Rescue Committee, which has been a key partner for us um, in responding to gender-based violence in West Africa over recent years. Um, what we've seen in recent recent weeks has been they're approaching us in the context of what's happening in the Horn of Africa at present and making, making the pitch essentially for support for their GBV responses in the Horn. The fact that we already had this very strong relationship with them, strong evidence-based relationship with them, going back, um, I suppose, something up to 10 years we're able to then support something that's quite innovative in, 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 a, in a very challenging context like, like Dadaab at the moment. And I suppose more broadly in, um, in, in, in the humanitarian sphere, we've worked quite closely with uh, the humanitarian reform process in recent years, the likes of the Good Humanitarian Donorship Initiative, um, striving to, to, I suppose, strengthen the underpinning of donors' decision-making across up to something like 30 countries who are members of GHD at this point in time. Um, we've also been very supportive of the cluster innovations that I mentioned earlier on, the likes of the SURF, this UN standalone funding tool, which enables organisations to tap into very, very quick access funding in the event of sudden onset emergencies. Um, then more broadly into, um, into capacity strengthening, we've had an initiative called the Rapid Response Initiative in recent years, um, which has... Um, inter alia, I suppose, provided support to some of our NGO partners to strengthen their own capacity in, um, in humanitarian response, and that's been quite successful. We've also done some work on um, the security of humanitarian workers, something that's quite preoccupying us at this point in time, and looking at innovative solutions and ways to strengthen and support the capacity of some of our NGO partners in this area. Um, and then on learning and quality, I think this is coming back to um, our individual supports to particular academic stroke research institutions, the likes of Feinstein in Tufts University, the likes of people in aid sphere I mentioned, um, ALNAP on the evaluation side. Um, and then there's also a range of organisations working on conflict and fragility, uh, the likes of International Alert, the likes of the International Crisis Group. Organisations involved, involved themselves in, I suppose, developing best practice, developing um, policy tools and while this is financial support in the main, and we'd obviously have certain uh, consultations with them on, a, on an annual basis, I think the challenge in terms of moving it to the evidence-based integration is to ask ourselves, how do they in turn engage with partners? How do they in turn work with, um, I suppose, academic institutions, with the media, with the range of major stakeholders in civil society um, to integrate the learning that they're, that they're discovering in terms of their own their own policy research. We'd also work very closely with DOCUS, the, the representative body of the Irish um, NGOs, and their, in turn, humanitarian aid working group. And I suppose what, innovations in that area in recent years has been identifying particular thematic priorities that we've all identified and to have sessions, discussions, workshops, um, looking at individual issues of, of, of concern. Just to say briefly that um, we're very live to the, the challenges in this, in this sector the challenges at all levels, the challenges in terms of integrating an evidence-based approach. Um, but we think it's the reality is this is a very new area for, for everybody involved in the sector. Um, and we think we have a fair enough assessment of where we are at as an organisation. We have uh, a white paper, government white paper, underpinning our development policy dating back to 2006, 
which is going to undergo a review um, early next year. And we think this is a very good opportunity um, to maybe pull together a little bit the, the, the kind of, again, the policy mesh with practice and, and with research to, um, to maybe put it up to ourselves a little bit uh, to assess what next steps are, are most appropriate in terms of uh, strength, strengthening the evidence base of what we're doing. Um, I think we're conscious that there has been lesson learning from the so-called mega emergencies. Um, and particularly in Haiti, I suppose, in, in the more recent times, we've been very involved in joint donor monitoring trips. Um, we're hoping to fund a newly established ALNAP evaluation office, a joint donor evaluation office in Haiti, um, to, again, integrate lessons learned into, into both the Haitian response, but also to extrapolate from that um, to other contexts. But we're very live to the fact that the challenge is to integrate and turn with our own limited capacity, the learning coming out of these types of exercises. Um, we aspire to, I suppose, building this research seamlessly into decision making. Um, but sometimes, even internally, it's very challenging to integrate the range of learning that, that colleagues that colleagues have, even within a small programme like Irish Aid, into everybody else's decision making um, processes. Maybe briefly then, just to, to broaden out the challenges, um, the humanitarian world is obviously just one strand of the... Uh, of the broader development context, and we're constantly meeting institutional challenges to um, to how that that humanitarian response is, is situated, and I suppose the pull between disaster risk reduction and and building resilience um, versus the, the the more arguably straightforward humanitarian response. Um, the kind of context you're working in in a sudden onset, the, the pressure to pull together information very short notice versus the pressure to respond very quickly is obviously something that complicates matters. Um, and I think we're live again to the risk that being overly ambitious perhaps here could in fact in due course represent an impediment um, to, to the actual things that we're, we're aspiring to. Um, and that things that are fairly difficult to measure and quantify at the end of the day, like protection, um, which we've discovered in the last year, having discussions with partners about what they understand to be protection, um, that we don't want this to, to effectively represent an obstacle to us supporting these types of interventions. Um, if I have two minutes very briefly to maybe look at the Horn of Africa, um, because I know it's the subject of one of the, one of the workshops, um, and not to come across as overly defensive, but I thought it, one of the, the, the challenges there is where the signs missed and was the evidence missed on the Horn of Africa, so I thought it might be useful to very briefly look at how we responded um, and maybe to put out some issues there um, in terms of our... our assessment I guess of the fact of that we have maximized the extent to which we were prepared for, for what happened but that there were obviously constraints that were outside our control. I think everybody is familiar with the, the current context in terms of the, the humanitarian crisis in the region um, and I think we've, we've been talking for two, three, four years within Irish aid about the need to, to spot early warning systems, to work with early warning systems to support them um, in a region like the Horn of Africa which has been so so pro prone to, to, um, to falling back into crisis um, in, in different ways and in different different facets on, on an almost annual basis for, for 20 odd years at this point. Um, and I think where we've seen some positives and, and building from evidence basis um, has been in our country programmes where we've had bilateral relationships with the likes of Ethiopia, where we've been able to integrate um, humanitarian approaches into longer term development activities like social safety nets, like ensuring that there's a, a effectively a social welfare system in place in the country that Irish Aid supports. Um, again, cash transfer is being flexible in how we respond to, um, to dips into crisis in, in various parts of the country. Um, integrating more humanitarian responses with, with development responses. Um, again, also those kind of innovative approaches I mentioned earlier, working with the likes of ENN with concern, with valid nutrition, um, again, on, on, on community-based management of acute malnutrition. Um, that goes back many years, as I said, so I think, again, um, the, the, the fruits of that, in a sense, were, were seen in, um, in our recent responses. The fact that we've been able to use our funding tools to some of our NGO partners through that HPP process I mentioned to, to respond to their identification of where the priority needs were in recent years, to their identification of the fact that the Horn was, was a focus for them and a priority for them. Um, I'm thinking of the likes of our partnerships with World Vision um, particularly in the area of disaster risk reduction and building resilience. They've done a lot of work in Somaliland and Puntland, um, and we've been able to support that on a kind of a protected basis over, over recent years. Um, I suppose where I would point to the constraints is that the nature of the context in each of the countries concerned in the Horn, um, and even with positive government partnerships in terms of our development programme and the likes of Ethiopia, there have been challenges in terms of the, the willingness of, of governments to, to accept the level of of crises at certain points in time. 
Um, and again, while we can work in the likes of Somaliland and Puntland, um, the challenges of the likes of South Central Somalia have been, have been clear and our access has been as limited as anybody else's. Um, so maybe just finishing up the, the sudden onset phase we think is particularly challenging in building in evidence. Um, <laughs> We need to learn more from humanitarian impact assessments. They are there. They've come out of most of the most recent crises over, over the last few years. Um, a stage response, again, going back to something I said earlier, these responses need to be rolling. They need to be constantly reassessed by partners and, and the evidence reassessed. Um, but it does enable us to, to respond to different sectoral priorities like gender-based violence as the situation evolves, as the context becomes clearer, and as the evidence available to us um, is strengthened. Um, just to contextualise it a little bit, we're conscious this is a new area for, for a lot of our other donor partners. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that international context evolves. Um, it's not just an Irish challenge. We've been um, mooting, I suppose, the, the, the possible support for a, a DEC type approach, DEC being the, 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 the body in Britain that brings together the British NGOs to, to co-fund, um, co-fundraise rather, um, in response to individual emergencies. Is this something that arguably could strengthen the kind of collaborative approach, the cooperative approach to responding to crises. Um, the question for us is how we link in again with all of these various international initiatives, um, how we use the research um, support that we provide to build up our own capacity, but also to, to put it out there and to ensure that it's as accessible and user-friendly as possible. Um, I hope I haven't gone too far over time. Um, thank you very much and happy to take any questions. What I'll think we'll do is we'll move, we'll try and move it. So it kind of set the scene a little bit there for Horn of Africa, which we're going to move on to and discuss now. Um, and I think some of the themes are going to come up in the small group discussions anyway. Um, certainly, and something that we need to be thinking about from the evidence perspective, Austin, if you want to come on with, uh, is that, you know, those challenges about what is evidence and I would encourage a small group discussion to tease that out, certainly those within the Centre for Global Health. These are the dynamics that we face about the research base, the possibility that you actually get in the way with evidence, but equally that desire to, to use information that is reliable to help guide the future. So we're going to... Okay. So straight to a bit of... Okay. Straight to data rather than straight a to. Uh, slide. So I'm pleased to introduce Austin Kennan from Concern. Joined Concern Worldwide in 2004 as the desk officer for Ethiopia and Somalia. Became the regional director for the Horn of Africa nearly four years ago. Their concerns worked for more than 20 years in the countries in the Horn of Africa, with the exception of Chad, where they entered in 2007. Uh, programs in the Horn of Africa consist of emergency response and preparedness, longer-term programs in things like health and nutrition. Austin came to Concern having graduated with a Master's in Development Studies from the Development Studies Centre at Kimmage Manor here in Dublin. Before that, he worked in uh, West Africa for five years. Awesome. Thanks very much, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I won't say too long on this slide. Um, I think it follows on to the point that Kira's making about uh, innovation. And uh, just to point to the, the numbers affected by this um, disaster, <coughs> is how I'd put it, um, is in the region 10, 12 million people are the kind of estimates. Uh, Concern works in three of the main countries affected, uh, Somalia, Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, and we're doing a range of different things. And in terms of innovation, we, we're finding quite a lot of success with the food vouchers program we're doing in uh, Somalia in particular. Uh, Kenya has done a lot of work on livestock protection. Li you, as we go on, we'll see livestock is a critical uh, part of this whole uh, situation. Um, and then we were involved also in the development of the CMAM approach um, that Kira mentioned. Uh, so just to just to give a little uh, flavour of the situation. Um, just to give you a quick overview uh, of the Horn of Africa um, crisis. Basically, this is not an emergency that occurred in 2011. This emergency has been going on for many years. Um, if in Somalia's case, it's been going on for 25 years. Uh, people have been living in this context of extreme vulnerability. Uh, and the three main factors, uh, this issue of frequent drought, whether it's down to climate change or whether it's other factors, 
um, but the, what people are experiencing on the ground is that where they would once have had a drought every 10 years, they're now getting it every three to five years. So we're engaged in multi-annual planning at the moment uh, for our development programming in these countries, and we're having to plan for probably two droughts over the next five years. Um, and that's not counting the current one, which is set to continue, sadly. The second one is um, the policies um, in the region affecting pastoralists and other marginalised groups. Uh, on a, an aside, I was listening to Vincent Brown last night and the reaction to his programme on travellers. It reminded me of the kind of the same kind of attitude to pastoralists in a lot of these countries is there. They tend to be marginalised groups and the government policies, etc., are developed by settled people. So they don't really reflect uh, their needs, etc. So that's part of it. Um, Somalia is particularly acute because of the conflict. That's the situation there. It doesn't have any policies. It's actually people are having to, ha to uh, cope with the conflict, uh, which, is, which is worsening at the moment uh, with Kenya's intervention into it and, and other actors as well. Um, and then the third thing, which is global but also local, is the escalation in food and other essential prices. So what we basically got coming together was a perfect storm. People, I remember in 2006, I think I was um, at a meeting in uh, London, and we were saying then, look, we could be having a famine on our hands in Somalia. Well, the people fooled us, they managed to cope, but now they've run out of coping mechanisms. So that's where, where we've got to now. Um, I, when I was looking at this, I found this um, a bit difficult to actually prepare for. I was actually thinking, okay, what... How should I approach this? I mean, there's two. There were two things that came to my mind. One was kind of evidence around the best practice in terms of interventions that Kira, Kira mentioned, but I decided to focus on the question really, which was was the evidence ignored, um, the early warning evidence. So I just want to track through it and um, perhaps give our perspective from a concern point of view. Now, the focus probably will be a lot on Somalia because Somalia was has been the worst affected country, um, but it would be reflective in Kenya and Ethiopia as well. Um, basically, um, the main early warning system in the region is FuseNet. People might have heard of it, but we can. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the FuseNet system was providing alerts since. Uh, uh, the, the end, towards the end of 2010. Um, a key trigger um, which we had was the Food Security Nutrition and Analysis Unit, which is a Somalia-focused um, organization based in, in uh, Nairobi. Um, one of the things they do is they do post-harvest assessments, and they, the goo rains are the rains uh, March, April to June, and then the dare rains is... October to December in that country. So they did a post analysis of the previous rains and they they flagged up that there was going to be a problem, that the harvest, the rains had not been good and the harvest was low. Um, we then, FuseNet were issuing different alerts based on weather forecasting and other things. And then a critical point was this post air analysis, which was in January 2011. That was a complete failure. And I remember a country director uh, ringing me up and actually saying, look, we're going to have a big problem. Um, so the dilemma, I suppose, for us was um, how do we actually publicise that? But I might get onto that a bit later. Um, this really just shows you the initial impact. And I don't know how well you can see it with the light, but that is the River Chabelle, which was a full-flung river when I was there. You had to cross it in a boat. I mean, it, it reminded me like of it's like if the Liffey went dry, basically. Um, that is completely dry there. Um, so the first thing, of course, was the water sources drying up. Um, the first, the, the next uh, point is when the livestock die. I think I mentioned this earlier that once, if livestock are critical, the livestock died massive mortality rates in some areas, fifty percent higher, higher than that. To get it down to the level of people, there was one man who uh, they sent me his case study. Uh, Muhammad Ali was his name, and he would, they would, when they were taking a picture of him, he was about to slaughter his last animal, and he had 200 before that. So that's just to make it on a personal. And then it led to the media moment. Now, concern had been, and other agencies, I mean, not just blowing our own trumpet, 
we had been uh, shouting about this, not in the media, because with regard to Somalia, it's very difficult to go into the media because it put our staff at risk. But we were shouting about this in different fora uh, from January up to June, July. Um, uh, sadly, the I would say the international community was slow to actually engage uh, for different reasons. But the media moment arrived in June, July. Um, when the refugees poured out to the Dadaab camp in Kenya and also into the Loado in Ethiopia and others poured into uh, the big towns and cities uh, Mogadishu, where this picture is from. Then there was a famine declaration uh, in some regions in Somalia and interestingly, it's an interesting statistic, the first time I think that a capital city or part of a capital city was declared in famine. Uh, the IDP camps in the internally displaced people camps like this in, in Mogadishu were declared to be in a state of famine. So agencies are scaling up at this time, or new agencies are arriving. So again, we were experiencing the similar kind of problems um, but that were encountered in the tsunami time. Agencies coming in with no knowledge of the context and you know, trying to engage and maybe not coordinating, etc. Coordination was a big problem. The funding became available rapidly at this stage, and we and other agencies were able to benefit from that. Now, this will just give you a map of the whole um, of the whole region uh, and the situation that we had at, the, at that time in July. I'll just move on. I might come back to it. Um, I suppose a big question is like, okay, the evidence wasn't acted upon early enough. We got into a situation where we had to respond to famine in Somalia and extreme situation in Kenya and, and Ethiopia also. So why was it not acted upon? Is a big question. Um, I was reading an Economist article, 30th of July 2011 recently, which I thought, which kind of uh, struck a chord with me. Um, it said that the early warning, it's almost like um, a, there were two things pushing. The early warning system was pushing, saying, yes, there's, there's a crisis, there's a famine, it's coming. Um, the economics of it was also pushing. Um, if you look at the Niger example, which it, it gives, is the prevention cost is much cheaper. So if you actually, if the donors actually put the money in early, so that agencies can respond, or the, and then actually there can be a saving. But um, on the other side, pushing against it is um, global political imperatives. I mean, quite frankly, there were other crises going on: the the Arab Spring, Libya, Syria, um, <laughs> uh, other priorities. The financial crisis um, was 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 focusing people um, in the countries which have the money. Quite frankly. There was also, in the Somalia case um, and in the region, a, a narrow war on terror focus. So it was kind of, oh, that country is it's too difficult to, to engage. Um, and access is an issue. I mean, we have to say that. I mean, it is difficult to work in these contexts and environments. Um, the, Kira touched on this as well, and, and I, I put it here, specific kind of context in the three countries. Um, again, with the government in Ethiopia, they tend to be quite um, sensitive and conscious about how Ethiopia is labelled, understandably in a lot of ways, but it does then restrict what you can say and what you can do. Um, and you have to get permission, you know, they direct you to where you have to go, etc. So it can be quite, it can take time to, uh, to, to, to get involved there. <laughs> Kenya also, they were slow to, to accept the crisis coming. There were various meetings April and May and the Kenyan government and other actors and the the system, the, the UN system, etc., didn't really um, have the urgency needed. And then Somalia, the coordination is done from Nairobi. So the coordination really didn't, didn't operate well. Um, so there were different contexts there. Having said that, the difference between, if I want to just, the difference in the, I'll go back here, the difference between South Central Somalia, I should say, and Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somali land, which is up here. The difference is that South Central Somalia had no real functioning government. So the other governments, um, whatever their limitations, there were some structures in place and you know something could be done. So this crisis is less severe, severe there in, in, in those countries. Maybe I'll just leave it there because kind of, I want to give people a chance to ask questions. I know it's, we haven't got into technical stuff, but I'm a bit of a generalist. So. Okay, thanks. 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 Yeah. Anyone want to ask questions? Austin it's generously uh, stopped slightly early, so for the back, yeah. Um, 
Um, from our own perspective, um, I mean, the way Concern works is we do work very, it's very much on the ground with the communities and that's actually what's enabled us to keep going in places like Somalia because the communities um, appreciate and accept what we're doing. Um, I think that's the starting point. Um, I would I would question a bit the, the assumption that the communities might be on the wrong wavelength. What we've tended to find actually is the communities are often on the right wavelength. They may not necessarily have all the information and that's where we have to come in and we maybe provide some additional information but generally we have found that you know all of this information I put up there is really coming it was coming from the communities um, and our kind of engagement with them so we would like for instance the food voucher program for example um, that's where we would add value because we you know there's evidence that cash transfers can work in certain contexts and uh, instead we, we, that was a, that there's another form of that is actually uh, providing vouchers to people so they can actually get food in the markets which are functioning and there is imported food there they can actually get food in those markets um, and without us having to bring in very expensive tons of food which is security and logistical implications so that's where we'd have added a you know our added value would be there but but the actual identification of the issues generally I found it's the communities and our staff etc would you know maybe nudge people and say well have you thought about this or what about that you know but Generally speaking, I found the communities are on the ball pretty much. I don't know if Kira wants to. Yeah, I suppose just to say that the, the, the credibility of, uh, is already there when an organisation like Concern is working closely with the community for a good number of years. So the, already the community level of scepticism would be extremely low. They'd be very willing to, to, to build on the fact that they'd experienced in previous situations that the support and the, the nature of the response from a partner like Concern would be, would be very expected. So they're they're basically drawing on that that history, I suppose, as well. Okay. Confidence. I'll just move. I forgot. Let's, let's take one quick one, and then we're going to move on to Paris. Talk. Uh, this okay. is just more of a comment, actually, than, um, than a question. It was just talking about the early warning systems, and there's no doubt the professional agencies knew for, for some years that the drought here was accelerating. Mm. And it did prevent a massive loss of life, like we saw in the 92, 93 Somali mm -hmm. famine. Um, but then I'm talking about other places when early warning systems pick up uh, the perfect storm situation, like in the Southern African uh, drought, severe drought in 2002, mm -hmm. when a lot of time and money was put in by the aid agencies because there was no conflicting mm. uh, other political situations or situations were going on, so there was not a lot of death or, or malnutrition that could get out of hand, and the agencies were actually accused of, of um, being alarmist mm -hmm. and wasting resources. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, it, it makes it very difficult to mm -hmm. react very well to early warning systems when you can have these two situations. I think that's a very good point, yeah. I think I'd agree with that. Okay. Uh, thanks very much okay. again to Hello. Austin. Uh, move on to Pat Gibbons thanks. from UCD, where Pat's thanks. the director of the Humanitarian Action Programme. Returned to academia in 1997, having spent several years working with um, development on humanitarian action in West and East Africa. He teaches and does research in areas such as humanitarian principles and concepts, management and societies in transition. Um, thank you. Uh, again, I, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me here today. Uh, I, I had more or less the same difficulties as Austin in that how do you, how do you go about addressing such a question, including evidence-based practice in academic curriculum? Um, so what I did was I went from the other side. I looked at what kind of questions the groups are going to be to be asked. Uh, questions like 
Do you think that students in the humanitarian sector should be taught res uh, research evidence? How can academic institutions that run master's programs promote the use of research? So, so this is where I, I, I want to get to. And my starting point is including evidence-based practice in the academic curriculum. Uh, when I was reading there recently, I was reading through a paper, I think it's a very interesting, interesting quote. If Rip, if Rip Van Winkle had been a physician, a farmer, or an engineer, he would, be employ he would be employed if he awoke today. If he had been a teacher in the 19th century, he would probably a good, be a good teacher today. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Slavin is discussing the American uh, educational system. Uh, but it's, it's just thinking about how we, within education, link with practice and how relevant some of the teaching is being done and how we're, we're moving. So, so what I want to, 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 how I want to approach the presentation is look at what constitutes evidence-based. Evidence-based practice, the, the academic stroke scientific practice nexus. Evidence-based practice in humanitarian action, and then just look at our, our, our own program to see how do we try to find that space. So, uh, evidence, I think most people would recognize the importance, and we've heard from our speakers before, it's critical to both academia and practice. However, there are ambiguities as to what constitutes evidence. Uh, looking at the the, the health or the nutrition side, evidence is, is often associated, whether correctly or not, uh, with this idea of, of positivism. And the positivism based on the fact that uh, the assumption that objective reality exists that can be observed by the researcher. And I think what I'm trying to, to, to address is something like the, the previ as previous question uh, a question from a, a, from the floor earlier on. Uh, to, to at the f at the very the very beginning, uh, reflect that most evidence that we find, whether in academia or in practice, it's couched in a particular theoretical or indeed conceptual framework. So that this particular statement, scientific evidence does not provide proof, it merely confirms our commitment to theoretical conceptual constructs provided by a paradigm that is already defined and counts as evidence. Which is, 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 this as well, if you bring it down to the practitioner level, I think is very relevant. From the perspective of, and I've already heard reference to, effectiveness of projects. But if one hasn't, like concern, as, as Austin said, gone out and, done, and, and carried out some rigorous needs analysis or stakeholder analysis, one can go ahead and develop a project that can be very effective and very efficient, but might have limited impact on the, the so-called beneficiaries or targets. So the evidence and what the evidence is couched is, is, is very important. This brings me to the idea that even what I read within is there psychology or indeed medicine, one, one sees that even in those discipline, disciplines, those that long advocate uh, positivism or quantitative research, question its appropriateness in, in areas where, on the basis of the adequacy to inve investigate complex social phenomena, especially when cultural and indeed gender and other issues come into play. Similarly, the cost effectiveness and resource availability. We heard Kira talk about the balance between expedience, as it were, and these hard information. And the limitations in actively engaging with, 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 with clients or, or ben beneficiaries, as Austin referred to the accessibility situation. Requirements to develop concepts, positivism often there to prove rather than to develop type of thinking. But, but from my perspective, the limitation of pos positivism, it does not in, to any effect uh, or does not affect the need for evidence-based approaches. They are there. So if, what, what we believe in, in our research is what we have to do is th the requirement is for personnel to develop a greater toolbox of research and approaches to come up with this valid knowledge on, upon which we, ca we can work. This brings me to the whole concept of, of, of evidence-based practice. Now, for the purpose of, of, of this talk and looking at uh, what happens in, in academic curricula, one would, would see it as being what is the nexus, that space that exists between academia and, and, and practice. 
And, and there's good examples throughout various, it varies within disciplines. I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with issues like the, the H-dip that requires one to go out and practice and is very carefully uh, taken through their application of their knowledge towards teaching practice. Similarly, I suppose with the medics, you have internships where you're totally coached through your knowledge and skills and competences. And even within the, the more, I suppose, uh, the, the, the skills based, whether it's carpenters and plumbers, they go through apprenticeships. Finding that space between academia and, and, and practice, I think, is very important. I, I think that uh, even within, within the whole frame that we, we are talking, academia has moved on considerably. Up to, to, to a number of years ago, we talked about knowledge transfer. Now there is greater emphasis on competences that, that need to be imparted, bringing together knowledge and skills. Unfortunately, from where I stand, I see a lot of programs that get somehow stuck in the middle. They set out outcomes and competences, but then they go in to deliver with methodologies and assess students on the basis of knowledge transfer rather than some of the skills that they might impart. And I think even within the, the medical faculty, we're seeing for calls for maybe selection of people with different skills rather than just tremendously high academic skills. So there is, in, in, in this sense, when one, when one looks at, at, at research, there is a sense, I think, out there that there's a kind of a, an academic stroke scientific imperialism when it comes to the academic uh, and the curriculum management. I, I for one, would, would, would say that that does exist, but I would also say that there is a requirement and a need to get practitioners to take more, uh, more control of the situation, get more involved. And this is where we're trying to see, well, how should academia and how should the practitioners and the policy makers come together in working towards that common goal? Um, bringing this, all of this then to the humanitarian, the, humanitarian, the humanitarian action or humanitarian response study framework, I, I think it's, it's, it's very important to say from this stance that humanitarianism is probably one of the oldest practices. It's very well documented down through the ages. But humanitarian studies, per se, is, is, is very new. And it, it has only been there, to the best of our knowledge, or when we, we review things since the mid-90s. The mid but before then, I think a lot of the, the practitioners that were working in humanitarian action, they tended to find their, their uh, knowledge and their, their education in different disciplines, whether it's in the medicine, whether it's in theology, whether it's in law, whether it's in management, uh, or indeed social anthropology, etc. But one would have to question then, why is there such a big growth in humanitarian studies and the need for humanitarian studies. I would pose some, some obvious reasons why, and I think that humanitarian action uh, and, and the need for it has, has grown with globalization. It has grown with, with a knowledge of what is going on around the world, but has been very much triggered by events like we heard uh, from Mary in 82, 83 in the Horn of Africa. We've also seen what happened in Rwanda. We've seen tremendous needs that are, that are out there. Some cynics would also say that it has also grown because of the 20-fold increase in support to humanitarian action that is, has happened in as many years. Others might say it's what we see in this whole humanitarian area is the, the proliferation of actors in this area and a huge, a huge growth in the range and the scope of actors involved in humanitarian action. And one can only say that it is going to increase if one looks at the apocalyptic prophecies, prophecies that one could imagine are going to be realized with climate change and with unease throughout the world. But I think it's important to bear in mind that what is, in looking at what is unique about humanitarian action and humanitarian action studies, I continuously talk about the studies as opposed to the discipline. 
the discipline as such I don't think really exists in that it isn't housed in a particular paradigm theoretical or conceptual framework yet. I would also say, but what is different about humanitarian action and the education in humanitarian action for me must be couched in those critical principles that govern humanitarian action. And the knowledge of the principles, the principles of humanity, the principles of neutrality, of impartiality and independence. And this is what gives it its, its uniqueness. So different than development, while development goes out there and there's, there's little consensus as to what is development, there is consensus or somewhat as to what is humanitarian action. Saving lives, alleviating suffering and support of life with, with, with dignity in areas associated with crisis. And there's codes of conduct that if academia is finding a place under the humanitarian banner, there are issues about respect for the human being and respect for, for their opinions and so on. It's also that there are certain characteristics of humanitarian action. And, and challenges, the balance, as I said, about between expedience and delayed action, the balance between pragmatism and principled approach, the balance between rights and needs as we strive towards the humanitarian imperative, constantly working with that dilemma we hear about early warning stroke addressing the immediate needs, a, 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 a complex dilemma where you're always trying to take the best of two worst options kind of situation. And the resource requirements are never going to meet fully the needs of, of, of uh, the, 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 the humanitarian need that is out there. But this brings me down to a crucial point. And, and in developing this area of evidence-based practice, I think it is crucial to, to, to build on what Kira has said, and indeed Austin, in that as academia has woke in the mid-90s to their roles and responsibilities, as it were, to, to support the, the global humanitarian need. Practitioners were well on the road and are well on the road working in evidence-based practice. True initiatives like SPHERE, like ALNAP, like HAP, uh, the Humanitarian Accountability Programme, like uh, People in Aid, and, and other such initiatives. For me, the big challenge is to see, well, how can we in somehow seem, a, seeming, a seamless way uh, come together so that academia can play its role and in, in, in helping and working with students and working with research to see how the toolbox of methods and approaches can be more, made more relevant to the ongoing need. So what we try to do in the master's program, we try to look at the interventions that should be guided by sound information, the basis of evidence. Governed and management by a broad stakeholder mix, trying to bring the parties together. Practitioners participate in the design and the delivery of the program. Just a content analysis of the program would show that research is very important. Uh, it underpins or, or cross-cuts all the teams to make sure that, stu that, that students are, uh, understand information and how to know when information is reliable and so on. It has a research module that is, focuses on applied research and the different tools and practices that are required. And there is a thesis component, a thesis component with an internship that I think can, can and should be more closely linked with, 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 with uh, the practitioners so that one can, there can be mutual learning. Um, much can be done to enhance the system, I believe. As, and, and the, especially the humanitarian education globally. Improved partnerships, collaboration, information, I would say as well within and between academic institutions. Uh, NOAA partners nine different universities throughout Europe and it is growing. But even in the Irish context, I think that we are a small nation, there are a small number of different institutions, each of them with valuable lessons and valuable assets to add. There should be more collaboration towards improved sharing of information. 
There should be stronger partnerships, especially in research. But this is very difficult because it's hard to go to Irish aid, it's hard to go to concern who are depending on public institutions. Often research isn't a priority. And, it's, and often within the institutions, humanitarian action may not be a priority when bums on seats and fees are a big issue. So there's challenges there. And we should, I think, as an Irish group of institutes and, and, and universities, we should be reaching out to a, a greater global constituency and, and, and partnering uh, such institution, institutions in nations that are very much affected by ongoing crisis. As stakeholders, I think students should also be part of the process. Their felt needs with other perceived needs shaped the program design and the direction, and this is what we try to do. And I'm very interested to hear from students and from other practitioners as to how to pragmatically we should be in linking more with the practitioners within our, our program design. I, I didn't spell out exactly what we do because we want to see what happens within the different discussions. And I, in, in finalizing, I go back to the, to, to the aforementioned toolbox and remember that to a person with only a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you need that bigger approach. You need that toolbox to go out to collect the required evidence. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pat. So we'll get to the last speaker now, which is Bonix Kerebu, who uh, I'm pleased that I work with in the evidence aid. Then we'll go into the small group discussions that Pat has uh, already signpost. Uh, Bonix is a medical doctor from the Democratic Republic of Congo with five years of professional experience. He's worked in both Eastern Congo and Rwanda before moving to Ireland. Uh, here in Ireland, he did an MSc at the Centre for Global Health. He's now working on a PhD in how agencies and others make use of evidence. And he's going to be talking to us about the uh, needs assessment survey that he's coordinating within Evidence Aid, which is looking to what, what is the attitude towards evidence, what is the need for evidence in those agencies. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my name is Bonix. Um, I'm based in the Center for Global Health, and I've been working for uh, Evidence Aid uh, since last year, now it's, I think, 10 months. And my work uh, consists to contact agencies and the funding bodies and explain what they are doing, because Evidence Aid is trying to to promote the use of systematic reviews in disaster settings. We know that there are different definitions of uh, evidence, but evidence aid is focusing on academic research, research evidence, and which is especially uh, based on systematic reviews. So if you, you, you had time to check the emails, you should have seen this, the link which leads to this website. And this is a Cochrane collaboration uh, website and if you can see you can see evidence aid and we can see some of the materials that we have already produced uh, also you can see the current uh, evidence aid survey that you are running so for some background about evidence aid so, so evidence aid was established after the indian tsunami in 2004 a group of researchers and other academic institutions provide a collection of systematic reviews focusing on different areas. And uh, this special, uh, special collection was provided to people who actually was in the field and other people who was based in different uh, uh, headquarters in order to help them to, to have access to update information. So four years after this the first intervention, the Cochrane Collaboration commissioned uh, an evaluation or t uh, about what happened four years ago and to see how people uh, use the information and what uh, were the challenges and if they have other questions which were not answered properly. So after that, uh, we 
we are now conducting a very broad uh, survey, which is, I can call a global survey. And the survey itself has been translated into four languages, English, French, uh, Spanish, and uh, Arabic. And what we are trying to do is to collect uh, many responses from different agencies and individuals, as not only uh, NGOs based in developed world, but also NGOs uh, based in poor settings. So I, I know there are a lot of theories about evidence. There are a lot of people with different views, but uh, we are not really into those kind of discussions. But what we think is that uh, there are some reasons why people should use uh, research evidence. First of all, we know that if an intervention is being unsuccessful, and if you want to measure if the intervention had an impact or not, you can use research to research research to to to, to know exactly if the the intervention has a good outcome or if it's a failure. One other thing is that you, you, you when making decisions, uh, especially people working at policy levels, before actually engage in funding organizations. They need some kind of information, information that would help them to identify if I fund this uh, project is cost is more is less expensive than the other one. So we also know that during emergencies, decision, uh, decisions are uh, are made quickly, and we know that uh, there are other factors that uh, policymakers. Uh, look at when they are making those decisions, but if they have to use uh, an information coming from research, we think that they should have an up-to-date information, a reliable information to back up their policies. The other reason to use uh, evidence is that uh, some interventions might expose people who are receiving them. And uh, also, we think that uh, evidence can help to explain the why a project has failed or why a project has succeeded. And one example is uh, uh, if you fund a project and you didn't take care to look at what were the objectives for the project, don't be surprised if you are, you, are, you are not capable of assessing the outcomes. Because sometimes agencies can say, for example, we are going to improve health outcome in setting X. And the intervention will be, for example, food uh, self-sufficiency. And then what they say, that uh, the, the outcome, the, the result that they would present to donors will be, we distributed maybe 10 tons of food. And if you compare, what were in the objective of the project and the outcome, it's easy for donor agencies to, po to, to post that the intervention has failed, not because it was badly delivered, but from the beginning they have a wrong objective for a, a, a wrong outcomes. So also we know that there are a lot of policies uh, around uh, making decisions, and a lot of decisions uh, are made uh, beyond doors. And sometimes they are conflicting uh, uh, information. But at least if people are discussing about which policy to implement, they need some kind of good evidence, evidence from research, which can help them to make those decisions. There are other people who are very skeptical about using evidence. They think that it's rhetoric is something that can't be in, done in practice. And other people who sometimes have conflicting uh, uh, evidence, and sometimes it's difficult to make the right decision. And uh, there are other people who have limited access to evidence. And also importantly, as other speakers said, but this is likely to, to emphasize, because as the researchers and many of you, we think that we have, we produce good material that can be used by policymakers. So sometimes we produce funding that actually do not have the right message that uh, policymakers can use. So the other thing is, uh, in many NGOs, there are what we call consultants or NGOs advisors who might have the best 
vested interest in providing some kind of information. Because what happens when the, there is a question for which people need evidence for, some people who are very clever, they can just Google it. And they, can, they, they will look at the strongest opinion and they will use that. So people who have vested interest, for example, if I have always an advice of a concern and uh, I'm in favor of, of the first article that I read, I think that is a strong opinion. I can I can use it to back up my 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 project. Then I can push, I can push, or I can, I can impose this kind of views to the old agency, and the agency itself it can use it without even knowing them. The other thing to consider is that we know that the evidence from research is not the only factor that policymakers use when they are making decisions. So if at one point a policymaker either a donor agency or uh, a, an NGO want to use research evidence, they need to have a, an update, a reliable information which can help make to make, to make good choices and to analyze the policies. <laughs> the other thing is uh, the conflict between public health approach and the right-based approach. Pub uh, people uh, promoting the public-based approach, they think that Interventions to, should be evaluated. We should have indicators. We should have the way to assess the practices, the things that you are doing. And those who promote right, the, the right based approach, they, 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 are, they focus more on what people need. There is an emergency. We need to collect money. We need to help people. So they are not really into what the indicators are. Uh, how, what are the outcomes? Are there any existing systems before that? Because most of the time, even in very uh, poor country, there are at least existing systems, health systems. They, they might be weak, but they exist. But when you bring in, we bring in uh, uh, AIDS, for example, you might destroy the existing system. So people who promote those right-based approach, they think that, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with one size fits all, it means that uh, you have the fair hand handbook and all the countries in the world, poor country, should uh, use that book and all the answers can be found in that singular book. So potential role for systematic review. The advantage of using research evidence, the advantage of using systematic reviews, is that if there is a question that has been asked, you, as we as the researchers, you are going to summarize all the existing information around that specific topic. And we are going to analyze individuals' articles that are included in the, 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 the systematic review. And then we are going to provide a summary. And this summary is a summary for all the existing information around, around that specific topic, not a summary for one singular study. The other advantage is that uh, but at the end of the day, a systematic funding from systematic review will show that if intervention works, which it doesn't work, if, or if uh, 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 actually it has been harmful. And the other thing, if, even if it doesn't give the evidence, at least it can show that there is a gap in the research. We need new research. You need to fund research in this specific area because we need evidence for this part. So, as I said before, uh, main, uh, main decision is being uh, made based on sing, uh, individuals or singular studies. So systematic review have the, uh, the advantage of bringing together all the information, all the publications around specific uh, 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 topic. And there is kind of transparency. You know exactly which article was included in the search and which one was not included and why it was not included. And if you read the summary, you can go back and ask, but I read an article for, for example, Noah, but he, she wrote a good article. And we, we are capable of providing the information why this article did. Maybe there is some bias within the methodology or the, the conclusions. So I'm going to talk now about the, the survey that we are carrying out now. And the, the purpose of this survey is to, to identify the attitude to our systematic review and other research evidence, and then to prioritize, to, to prioritize uh, which systematic review should be done, 
and also to know what's their preference, how they want to access to this kind of information. So we conducted 10 uh, semi-structured uh, interviews with uh, uh, people within different agencies. This include WHO, uh, UNHCR, International Committee for Red Cross, Medicine and Frontier Epicenter in Paris, Action Aid in London, and CDC, the Center for Disease and Control in Atlanta. And as you can see, after doing systematic, uh, systematic, uh, uh, thematic, tem uh, thematic analysis, we come up with some, some themes. And you can see that they recognize there is poor evidence. And these are senior humanitarian workers. They are not even people working in the field who don't know what science is about or who don't know about evidence. These are people who plan, who have been working in the humanitarian sector for more than 10, 20 years. So these are the views about the evidence in the humanitarian. They recognize that evidence in the humanitarian assistance is very, very poor. They know that there are existing uh, guidelines, there are existing handbooks like Sphere and the others who, which have different indicators. But when you assess why should someone have 10 liters of water a day, there is no answer. So there is no, there is little science about those indicators, about those books. So the other thing is the weakness in reporting system. I think donors should be aware that people who collect information on the field are not the same who write the final report. So most of agencies would have consultants who write the final report and who will send this report to donors. So there is a, a a bias in the reporting system. And the other thing is the quality of data. I think one of the speakers mentioned CRED. We are in contact with CRED, we, we invited them, and we presented the same, this same finding to more than 73 people in Oxford two months ago. And people recognize that people who plan for humanitarian emergencies using information from different uh, sources, such as CRED, they don't understand how unrepresentative this information is. So there is a problem there. So people then suggest a topic. So we ask them if they have different topics for each they need, the thing they need evidence for. So this, are, this, are, this is a list of topics I'm not, I'm not going to read. You can see it's a variety of topics. Some of them are not even questioned. But we are, what we are going to do is to, 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 to collect all the topics and then to ask those agency people who responded to the, the, the survey to prioritize, then we can provide systematic view for those topics. So we've, we've been talking about uh, uh, different kind of evidence. This was one of the questions for the, the survey. So we asked people to rank uh, this, this different type of evidence and, the, uh, and to say what kind of evidence, evidence might uh, influence their decisions. Here you can see it's very big disparity. You can see that scientific evidence is coming on the top. This is, uh, was the first choice, and the personal experience is, uh, is uh, the second one. But this, it, the second uh, personal experience was the second choice. If I, I didn't have time to write all the 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 the, 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 the the choices, so we also ask how useful you think systematic review can be in disaster setting. You can see these are the fresh, uh, when I say these are new data, it, these are not even published yet, but you can see that eight, more than 81% say, say that systematic review are useful, they can be used. So we ask, have you already used systematic reviews? Or as you can see, more than half have already used systematic reviews. We are not talking about systematic review from Cochrane collaboration, but all the systematic reviews. The other question is that how they would like the information, systematic review summary from systematic review to be presented to them. You can see that they want reviews, but they want comments from people like uh, Austin and other people with experience to comment on the, the reviews so that they, they can use them because they, they might contextualize the information that is included in, in the review. They also want to access the reviews online. We also ask, do you think that if you access to 
systematic resistance likely to improve uh, the responses to nat nat natural disaster? You can see, yes, more than 80%. There were some uh, suspicions that um, donors really don't want evidence. They have their own particular agenda, and uh, when they give the money to organizations that they think they can, they can do the job, but uh, then you ask if they think that systematic reviews can help them to assess the likely effect of projects before providing fundings. So even donors themselves, they recognize that there is a need to provide systematic reviews. So our conclusion just for the, this preliminary data, and this is for 59 uh, participants, so we're still collecting data, I think that we're getting, is that uh, humanitarian Ed Walker recognized that evidence-based practices in, in, this, uh, in humanitarian assistance is very poor. The systematic reviews can be used in, uh, in the humanitarian sector, and donors and humanitarian aid workers need them. They want systematic reviews with uh, comments from experts, people who have experience uh, in the field, because systematic preview producers are not, uh, are not those who actually work in the humanitarian sector. So we can't pretend that we produce what uh, the, the uh, people in the field need. The other thing is consider that uh, there are a lot of uh, topics that they need evidence for, and we need, we as evidence aid, we need to pro prioritize those topics, and also to, 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 to make sure that uh, uh, they are used. So the next step is we need more participants for, uh, to the survey, and also our priorities are now, and that was one of the reasons that we are here today, is to engage with different uh, partners. Because uh, last two months ago uh, at our conference, we have very few Irish NGOs, and uh, even if the project is based in the Center for Global Health, so we felt that this is a great opportunity to, to engage with Irish NGOs to discuss the issue and see how how well we can work together. So we are trying to identify academic courses and provide training, but we think that if we, we donors are aware of how uh, information has been gathered in the humanitarian sectors, how the reports are, uh, uh, has been written, and what are the weaknesses in every stage of the program reporting, and if academic institutions start to raise awareness about the poor quality, about the material that students need when they write the assignment. And if students can be aware, aware of how to analyze information that they're dealing with, with. So I think together we can come up with uh, new things and we can promote evidence aid. So these are our partners.